that's out with that event. Also, um, we are running, as a church, we're running a little low on canopies. We had a summer camp past few weeks, and I was told that they might not have made it through the summer camp. So that's something else you can sign up for. Send us an email. Let us know if you have an extra canopy, a tent. Um, we would greatly appreciate that. Go a long way in the Florida heat to have some shade. Shade is a gift from God. All right, so <clears throat> really big announcement. July 24th, 25th, and 27th, Greg Violi will be in town. 24th, 25th, and 27th, that's a Wednesday, Thursday, and Saturday at 7 p.m., okay? So we'll be, uh, you know, obviously announcing this the next couple weeks, but I will just tell you um, what Kyle told me four years ago when Greg Violi came the first time I saw him. We announced it probably three months in advance, and Kyle, who I didn't really know too well at that time, but I now would trust with my life, he looks at me and he says, find a way to get in the building when Greg Violi is here. And I said, okay, I'll try. And those three days that he was here, I am still chewing on the revelation that he shared. Okay? It's still in here doing its thing, okay? And it's still in here being used by the Holy Spirit. So Greg Violi is someone, he's a father in our house. Uh, he's from Germany, but we just let him come. And I know Richard, so I can say this, that we don't put any limits or parameters on what he can share on. We say, Greg, whatever the Lord is sharing with you, we want to hear it. And that has been encouraging. That has been convicting. <laughs> And it's always been edifying. He is a man who has the Father's heart more than anyone else I have ever met in my life. So come and find a way, just find a way to get in the door. You don't have to come all three nights, but find a way to come and hear him. It's going to be awesome. All right. Um, last announcement is that next Sunday we are having baptisms. Baptism Sunday, July 7th. So if you'd like to get baptized, find me. Um, find anyone in leadership and just let us know and yeah, we'd love to love to get you baptized and we're doing one next Sunday. So um, just before before we get into worship, the one thing that's been on my mind this week that I'll share and then we'll we'll pray and worship the king of all kings um, is that the place that God is calling you to go, how many of you know that if you are a Christian, you're a son and a daughter of God, right? And that God has a call on your life. There's a call on your life. And the thing that's been on my mind this week is that you will never fulfill that call on your life if you are not in community. Because the place that God is calling you to go, you cannot get there alone. So, find community, find discipleship, because we are, a, we are the body of Christ. There's no such thing as a self-made, self-taught Christian. That does not exist. So, find community and accept that God has sent others to teach you things. And without those other people, you will not fulfill the call of God on your life. So you might as well just accept it and humble yourself and be vulnerable, vulnerable around people. Okay. So, Father, right now, in Jesus' name, we're here as the body of Christ. And we just come, Lord, to worship you, to praise you. We thank you that right now all of heaven's angels are surrounding this place, God. And we just... Uh, we just match heaven this morning. We just want to match heaven this morning, Lord. We take everything that we've gone through this week, and we just say, Lord, all of that has to bow to you right now in Jesus' name. All of it has to bow to the King of all kings. We love you and we praise you. stand or come to the front or sit, whatever you feel led to do this morning.
just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for blessings Jesus, you don't
Fall short. I've got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I often do, but every song.
would sing these songs as I often do. And every song must end.
your voice. He is worthy.
Thank you, worship team. Good morning. How is everybody? Good. Good to see you all. Uh, Richard's out in Mexico, so keep him in your prayers. Um, so y'all have me tonight. <laughs> you haven't heard me speak yet, but thank you. <laughs> Um, we're going to do something a little bit different this morning, um, and before I start with the message, I want to invite the School of Kingdom Ministry team to come up. If you want to, uh, if you have a word, we're going to practice, I say practice, but they've been practicing prophetic words. Um, <clears throat> sometimes it happens in the moment, sometimes God gives us things beforehand, um, the School of Kingdom Ministry uh, we've been running is a 27-week course, um, and it's a practical discipleship course. We don't have time for everybody to give a word, um, but we'll give a few words, um, and then maybe perhaps uh, ministry time, they, those who haven't given a word, maybe you guys can give a word later. Um, so, everybody's familiar with prophecy and the way the prophecy works is we know in part, we prophesy in part. Um, it's something that Paul writes for us to earnestly desire because when that does happen, uh, somebody comes into church and say, says, God's here, God's speaking. So we want to do this, and before we do this, I want to kick it off with prayer. So Lord, thank you for this, this morning. Thank you for your presence. I pray that um, you would speak to your people and that you would reveal your heart to them um, and even, you know, s speak through me. Bless this time, Lord. Bless the message. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I'll go first. So, ma'am, I don't know you. You, you have glasses? Um, yeah, it's you. <laughs> My name's Mark. Um, I haven't met you. What's your name? Michelle, nice to meet you. Um, when I look at you, I see like somebody that's, have you ever been skiing or wakeboarding, pulled behind a boat? No, okay. So the initial pull is tough. Like it's easy to get underwater with the initial pull um, because that sudden pull gets, like it's, if you're not used to it, if you're not positioning your feet correctly, you can go underwater and it just, it's overwhelming. Um, what I see the Lord doing in your life is that it's, it's a matter, it's your posture, it will enable you to rise above the waters of turbulence and interruption. And the pull of God on you is such that um, when he calls you into something, when he, and when he calls you to do something, it allows you to glide over all these little turbulence and interruptions of stuff. Um, and so I... Uh, I foresee or I, I bless the, the call of God on you. And how that looks may be just, you may feel God say, okay, Michelle, let's pray. Okay, Michelle, let's, let's worship. Let's go for a walk. And you saying yes to God and positioning yourself enables you to just go over all these things that you may be going through. And it's not, it's not a matter of like sin or, or something you're doing wrong. It's just life. And so I think God has something really good for you just to say yes, and it's easy to get over all these, like, just the stuff of life. Amen. Bless you. I hope that makes sense to you. And if it doesn't, please tell me. <laughs> good. All right. Anybody else have something? All right, come here. I always feel insecure doing this, but God gave me a word this morning before we even came to church. And um, I saw you kind of highlighted in my vision. What's your name? Are you right here in the pink? Debbie. Debbie. So what I saw was like a pitcher pouring water 
all over you. And that's the Holy Spirit coming upon you and saying to you, I am with you. I'm going to flood you. Not just like a little trickle. I mean like a lot. Like a lot of water. A lot of Holy Spirit. And Joel says that he's going to pour out his spirit on us. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. So pray for that. Pray into that. What does God have for you? Do you hear something? Do you see something? Do you dream? Pay attention to those things because he has more for you. He has a lot for you. And then um, 2 Corinthians, I lost it, but it says something, okay. The Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So God is calling you by his spirit into a new freedom. And it's not you. It's not like you've got to build it up or you've got to make it up or you've got to do something. He is pouring out on you. And so I call blessing upon you of his spirit that you will hear him, see him, and that you will come into a new freedom that you've never had before. And it will all be because of him, not because of you. So you don't have to strive. You don't have to struggle. He is going to do it all. Your job is to just listen and hear and obey. Mm. So. I'm like Kathy. Uh, something came to me this morning because we were prompted that we were going to do something <laughs> sometime during the service. <laughs> uh, Surprise. <laughs> So anyway, I'm going to have to walk back here because uh, I don't know your names, you two guys. Y'all came to my mind. Hey, Daryl. Daryl and Melissa. The word is newness that came to my mind. And you go, well, we just started coming to this church a few <coughs> weeks ago. That's not it. You know when I say newness what it means. There's something that is fresh, old things are breaking off. And it's refreshing, but it's a newness that y'all know that's coming upon y'all. Y'all need to reach out and grab it. Y'all need to reach out and grab it and accept it, receive it, saying it is mine. Don't believe the past. So people, things will come against you going, that's, you know, dude didn't know what he was talking about in church. I have nothing to do with it. It's not me. It's what the Lord has given me. It's a newness, a refreshing grab it. Amen. Bless you. Hey, Kat, something. Wallers, raise your hand. The Waller family. The enemy is trying to run amok in your house. He's been trying and trying and trying. He's been trying to put roadblocks in your way, traps in your way. And I'm hearing the Lord say that he's nullifying that. That newness in life. And abundance will be in your house once again. And that the enemy and his, his schemes, they, they're like mosquito bites. Treat it as mosquito bites. It's nothing serious. It's nothing heavy. But the Lord says, remain in him. Keep your eyes focused on him. He is with you. Amen. Amen. The Lord highlighted um, Ava to me. May I speak to her, please? Um, first of all, you look like an angel to me all the time. And it helps that you're sitting under that light right now. <laughs> um, I sense the Lord telling me to tell you you're wise beyond your years and to remind you that our Lord and Savior it, it made a point to tell us that he grew in wisdom and in stature 
and in favor with God and with man. And I just feel like I'm supposed to highlight wisdom. And baby girl, wisdom is not book knowledge. It's knowledge that comes, um, maybe your mama can give you some good wisdom. You know, how much soap to put in the uh, laundry powders to put in, you know, the washing machine. But there's wisdom that comes from on high. And I just want to remind you to press into that wisdom. Um, and you may not even realize it at the time, but you're going to look around and you're going to see your friends and other people in your circle doing things, but the Lord's calling you to rise above them. Um, just seek the higher things. But you have wisdom all over you, and the Lord wants to give you more. Amen. Amen. Maybe one or two more. Everybody on this side is going. <laughs> we need a couple over here. <laughs> the pre- the pre- <laughs> Is it right if, if I talk over the whole group? Sure. I mean, if the Lord's leading you. Use a mic. <laughs> I see I see the whole church just like at the bottom of a waterfall but we're not like directly underneath the waterfall we're out in the outskirts where the winds are just blowing mist and now and then we get a cool refreshing mist but there's so much there's so much more to step into and for those of you who don't just want to get that mist now and then when the wind comes our way who want to step into the continual waterfall that never once runs dry I just want to speak that over you for boldness, for faith, for wisdom, and just for more of him to step step into the continual refreshing of the Holy Spirit and not just a gust here and there that feels nice, but to be drenched, drenched Amen. in every bit of him. Amen. Amen. we got a couple over here. just saw a friend of mine walk in, Kathy, and when you did, Kathy, it was like the glory of the Lord just fell on you, and as I closed my eyes and I was praying about that, I see you as like a, a flower, like a zinnia, with many, many petals that the Lord is opening more and more and more. He has so much more for you, and he wants, he wants to share his heart. He wants deep relationship with you. And there's so much more that he wants to give you. This will also be a time of blessing for you, growing in him. Amen. Amen. Does that ring true for you all? Yes, and I have to say, I just saw you in your city last night. Oh. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Paul, you got something? Kathy? I don't know this young lady's name either, but you've been highlighted to me. Your name? Lois. Lois. Lois, the word, usually I get just the word, and the word that I got was legacy, and that the Lord is so pleased with the legacy of your life, and there's much more to come, and the fruit of your life is... um, love and worship and God is pleased and he said I want more I want more of your worship but I'm pleased with the legacy of your life and then I have one more Um, this little guy over here what's your name sweetie Michael Michael I believe that the Lord um, says to you hi Michael I have put my love in you, and you, you're a carrier of the love of God. You are a man of compassion and strength. Um, you represent Jesus well. So guard your heart. Don't go the way of the wor- world, because you are a lover of men. Amen. Christine. noticing your shirt. What's your name? Zeke. 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 You have a, I feel a call to the Navy? Your brother. 
but still I was going to say to you that the, the motto on the, on the crest for the, for the academy is ex silentia tridens, from knowledge seek out. So the dream that the Lord has put in your heart, the knowledge is what brings the power. So put your sound hand to the studies. Walk in the dream. Keep hold of it. The Lord has a calling upon you. And he wants you to never let go of that dream that he's put in your heart. Yeah. Amen. Let's get one more. Paul. So, Michelle, I know your name now because of Mark. <laughs> um, but you were highlighted to me this morning. And um, I saw you going into the road with your boys and um, I felt like the Lord was saying is that where you might have thought there's disappointment, like he delights in you. And there's a, a verse in Isaiah 62, 62.4. Never again will you be called the forsaken city or the desolate land. Your new name will be the city of God's delight and the bride of God, for the Lord delights in you. So I just feel very strong, like he delights in you. And an area that you thought might have been a failure or disappointment, that he's delighted in you. He also took me to Isaiah 49 for you. Um, yet Jerusalem says, the Lord has deserted us. The Lord has forgotten us. Never. Can a mother forget her nursing child? Can she feel no love for the child she has born? But even if that were possible, I would not forget you. See, I have written your name on the palms of my hands. Always in my mind is a picture of Jerusalem's walls and ruins. Jerusalem's walls, like it's symbolic for suffering, right? And so like God wants you to know, like he's seen your suffering and he's not forgotten. Amen. And your name is written in the palm of his hand. Amen. Amen. All right. Good stuff. I hope that blessed you all. Um, if, if you guys have a word, uh, give it uh, ministry time for the individuals that the Lord highlighted for y'all. All right. Bless y'all. Okay. Amen. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mark Rummel. Um, I serve in leadership here at the church, and I also am a chaplain at the federal prison on Capitol Circle. So every time you drive by there, just say a prayer <laughs> for those people there, and me too. Um, in ancient Greece, there was one city known to be the fiercest, the most deadly, and the most effective they were different than all the other cities in Greece. Um, and in that time, you had these city-states um, that they governed themselves, and sometimes they would get along with each other, and sometimes they would go to war with each other. One of those times happened was the Peloponnesian War between 431 and 404, um, and Greece was in chaos. The city of Corinth had gotten into a scuffle with another city, and that other city was aligned with Athens, and Athens created this Athenian league of cities that were all allied together. In response, Sparta created this Peloponnesian league of allied cities in the south. Athens was in the north, Corinth is in the middle, and Sparta was in the south. Corinth is the same city that was written in the Bible. Um, so long story short, the Spartans came out on top and toppled Athens and basically ended the golden age of Greece. Sparta wholly revolved around a culture of war. It was centered on military service. Everything revolved around serving the, the state. Young boys ended, entered the agogi at age seven, which emphasized education, obedience, military training, duty, discipline, courage, self-control, and endurance. And in fact, the word Spartan means self-restrained, simple, frugal, and austere. Spartan men um, had one job, and that was to be a soldier. From age 20 to age 60, they were full-time soldiers. They all slept in the barracks together, and they had to sneak away to spend time with their family and wives. So the Spartan society, they, just, they had three groups of, of people. One were the Spartans, who were citizens. The other were the helots, who were the slaves. And the others were the perosi, who were the skilled laborers who did all the 
technical stuff, blacksmith, all this stuff. And so the Spartans, so they would go out to war, they'd capture slaves, and they would bring back these, these people, and they would be doing the day-to-day chores, farming and washing and doing all this other stuff. And so it's no wonder that this city that was wholly focused on war was able to conquer basically ancient Greece. Uh, in fact, when they toppled Athens, they, the Athens had a focus on many different things. We have legacies of art and culture and uh, philosophy and democracy and all these things that were centered in Athens. And, and so it's no wonder that Athens, that was focused on many things, got conquered by a city that was focused on one thing. Now, you've, you guys have probably heard of or watched the movie uh, 300. Um, I don't recommend it from the pulpit, but <laughs> it's an over-dramatized comic book, book version of this real battle that happened um, in that, in that the Battle of uh, Thermopylae. 300 Spartans went to war against a countless army from King Xerxes. And uh, the figures of the Spartan army were known, or there were 300 men. Uh, the, the count of Xerxes' army is unknown, but it could range from a million to two million people. And they were all bottlenecked in this short, narrow pass. And the, the story is true. They, were, they took advantage of the terrain and conquered Xerxes' army, even though it led to their death. And it, they were betrayed by Ephialtes, who showed them how to get behind them. They knew that they were going to their death, and yet they still went. And it's the very reason why they existed. This was their moment that they trained for their entire lives, and no one else could have pulled this off but them. Now, why do I tell you this little history lesson? Because Jesus has a call on you that is so intense and so singular that your response must match. I can't sugarcoat the words of Jesus. And he says, follow me. Pick up your cross and follow me. Cross was an instrument of torture and death. Matthew 10, 37 says, Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. But but Jesus, let me go bury my dad. His response is basically, no, let the dead bury their own dead. In in that context, it would take a year to do the burial process, so it's not this immediate funeral. But Lord, let me take care of my business. Let me put my affairs in order before I follow you. And Jesus says, no, whoever puts their hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. This is a tough pill to swallow, but it's nonetheless what Jesus calls us to. The call of Jesus supersedes all priorities. Your mom's not going to save you. Your children aren't going to save you. Your business or self-importance, whatever you do in life, they are not what's going to judge you at the end of your life. Jesus will judge you. St. John Chrysostom said, if you knew how quickly people would forget you after your death, you will not seek in your life to please anyone but God. So today I want to emphasize the fact that Jesus came to be our model in life. He he focused on basically two things, intimacy and obedience to the Father. This was his singularity of purpose. This is what he did. He said, I will go and I will do and I will say what the Father says and does. And so he wholly devoted himself to following the Father and pleasing the Father. In Luke 11, 33, Jesus said, No one lights a lamp and puts it in a place where it will be hidden or under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand so that those who come in may see the light. 
Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eyes are healthy, your whole body is also full of light. But when they are unhealthy, your body is also full of darkness. See to it then that the light within you is not darkness. Therefore, if your whole body is full of light and no part of it dark, it will be just as full of light as when a lamp shines its light on you. The light within you, the the living presence of God, is supposed to be seen. Not only that, it is what you are supposed to see the world with. In fact, it was supposed to be so effective, this light of God, that it drives out darkness. And people see this. Jesus uses this analogy that your eye is your lamp. In effect, he is saying that what what you look at and what you pay attention to, if that is healthy, then it will bring health to your whole body. That's a good sentiment, but it fails to capture the full meaning of what Jesus is saying. This comes out in the Greek. He says, your eye is the lamp of the body. When your eyes are healthy, that word healthy is haplous. And what it really means is being motivated by singleness of purpose so as to be open and straightforward, to be sincere without guile or duplicity or hidden agenda. Do you get what he's saying? You must be singularly focused on him, the light of the world, the hope of glory, and it will bring health to your entire being without duplicity, without an agenda. In the Jewish way of thinking, the body was holistic. Uh, We like to separate it into parts, but Jesus is saying what you look at, if you focus on me, will bring health to everything in you. Now, I've found in my own life that if I focus on trying to to do better or try to not sin, I end up sinning. I become so focused on my sin, and therefore I do it more, and I become hyper-aware of my failures. But if I focus my affections on Jesus, I find that all of my failures and all of my sins just fade away. They aren't issues anymore. I'm focused on the light, and the light dispels the darkness. This is how you do it. You all have lived enough life to realize that if you disobey God, there are natural consequences and there's also spiritual consequences to opening up doors that shouldn't be opened. Um, Said another way, if you walk in disobedience, you create a stronghold that is not easily removed from your life. And Jesus' solution is saying, focus on me and this will dispel the darkness. So Jesus came and he modeled this for us. He came so that you may follow his way of life, his obedience, his intimacy with the Father. He emptied himself of all other agendas. He emptied himself of self-importance, and he he laid down, as Philippians 2 basically says, he laid down his superpowers to live this life of a servant. He associated with the down and out. He was persecuted for doing the right thing, and he got martyred for it. And he tells us to do the same. Why? Why does Jesus have the right to say that? Well, simply put, because he's worthy. He is worth all we have to give. I don't know how else to put it other than he's worth it. He rescues us from hell. He saves us from our sin and saves us from our own demise. He shows us unfailing love, unconditional love. He gives us grace. He empowers us with the Holy Spirit and he promises eternal life. That's what he does. I follow Jesus because he loves me and he's worth everything I have to give. Now, I admire those who serve in the military. They believe our country is worthy to be protected, all of our freedoms and our our individual sovereignty and our democratic process. And they're all noble endeavors. And I, I even admire these 300 Spartans because they fought to the very end, not only because of their sacrifice, but because they devoted everything to prepare them for that moment. 
Their entire lives culminated to that point. That's what they were trained to do, and that's why they existed. So what about you? There's a call on my life and on your life that is still life and death. The bar cannot be lowered to my expectations or my experiences. I must rise to the occasion. The occasion has been and always will be to take up my cross and follow him, to deny self and follow him, to have singular focus and loyalty to my Savior and King. So turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2, if you have a Bible or a phone. Second Timothy is Paul's last letter. He's in prison. He's going to die. He knows this and even writes, I am now being poured out as a drink offering, meaning his blood is going to be spilled. He's imploring Timothy to fight the good fight, and in chapter 1, verse 8, he says, Share in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God. He has saved us and called us with the holy calling not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace. You have a holy calling on your life. And it is important to remember that God didn't call you because you were so special or you could accomplish so much. He he didn't call you because of his need for your agenda. He called you for his own purposes, for his own graces, He simply just wants your yes. John Wimber, who founded the Vineyard Movement, he said this sentiment, and I like it. It says, I am change in God's pocket. He can spin me however he sees fit. Can you say that about yourself? Say, yes, God, I'll go wherever you say to go. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll lay down my life and follow you. So 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verse 3, Paul will start, he will say something spiritually significant, and then he'll say something practical. He describes this analogy, and he fleshes it out. He says in verse 3, Share in suffering as a good, good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one in military service gets entangled in matters of everyday life. Otherwise, he will not please the one who recruited him. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he will not be crowned as the winner unless he competes according to the rules. The farmer who works hard ought to have the first share of the crops. Think about what I'm saying, and the Lord will give you understanding of all of this. Charles Spurgeon, a well-known author and theologian, said, Do not expect to be honored in a world where your Lord was crucified. If they persecuted the master, why would they not persecute you? Paul's first injunction to Timothy is to, who is a young pastor in Ephesus, is he's, his first injunction is to train up faithful men who will teach others. And his second injunction is to share in the suffering for Christ Jesus. Paul faced suffering head on. Jesus told him, you will suffer for my name. I will send you all around the world and you will suffer. In effect, because he persecuted the church, but suffering is part of following Jesus. Paul is writing from prison in Rome. The year is 67 AD and the Roman emperor Nero has unleashed one of the most brutal campaigns of persecution against Christians. In 64 AD, there was a massive fire that destroyed much of Rome And Nero blamed the Christians. He accused them of being guilty of, quote, hatred towards the human race. So Christians were persecuted, rounded up, imprisoned, beheaded, burned alive, fed to lions, crucified, and everything else you can think of. Peter suffered the same fate. He was caught up in this first wave of persecution. Um, There's a little bit of debate of whether he died in 64 or 67, but it looks like he died in October of of 64 with this first wave of persecution. 
And he writes in 1 Peter 4.12, Dear friends, don't be surprised when the fiery ordeal comes among you to test you as if something unusual were happening to you. Instead, rejoice as you share in the sufferings of Christ so that you may also rejoice with great joy when his glory is revealed. If you are ridiculed for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory of God rests on you. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in having that name. Biblical suffering is always in the context of being persecuted and reviled in a pagan culture. Biblical suffering is not equated to sickness, even though in our modern language we conflate the two. I'm suffering from this cold or whatever. So I want to ask you, have you suffered for the Lord? It's a weird question to ask, but suffering for the Lord is a mark that the Spirit of God rests on you. Later in in 2 Timothy, Paul says, everyone who follows the Lord will suffer. So don't be surprised if you are reviled, hated, rejected, persecuted, or betrayed. That's only natural. Now, I'm not talking about some human disagreements where you have some miscommunication or misunderstanding. I'm talking about when someone accuses you or betrays you and, and thinks that you're full of the devil when you're actually full of God. <laughs> and then that person conspires to try and get you fired <laughs> or maligns you to the news or even to the governor of Florida. That's happened to me. Um, now, surprise, it's not the first time and it won't be the last time. So if it happens to you, just get comfortable. <laughs> get used to it. It's just going to happen. Now I am in a place where I'm fine with it. And actually, I'm kind of happy about it. I'm kind of like a little bit proud about it because it just means that the Spirit of God is on me. The same thing is for you. If you have, if you're doing the right thing, you have nothing to fear. You're following the Lord the best you can, and you're, you're entering into these good places with the Lord, so of course it's going to ruffle the feathers of the enemy. Of course he's going to get on to you and accuse you and belittle, belittle you and try and throw your sin in, in your face. But back to 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verse 8, Paul writes, Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, a descendant of David. Such is my gospel, for which I suffer hardship to the point of imprisonment as a criminal. But God's message is not imprisoned. So I endure all things for the sake of those chosen by God, that they too may obtain salvation in Christ Jesus and its eternal glory. This is a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, since he cannot deny himself. Paul's motivating factor in remaining steadfast in the face of persecution is for the sake of the chosen. And I like how the NLT puts it. He says, I'm willing to endure everything if it will bring salvation and glory in Christ Jesus to those that God has chosen. Meaning, the church weighs so heavily on his heart that he wants to do everything so that his suffering may be productive and inspirational and life-changing to the church. I don't have time to go down the rabbit trail of what means what election means, but I can tell you what it does not mean. Election does not mean predestination as in a guarantee of what God will do. God didn't elect or guarantee some people to go to hell and some people to go to heaven. That's not what he's talking about. Otherwise, Paul wouldn't use the word may and in Greek, it still means the same as English. It means may. It means uh, by chance or perhaps. 
the word elect just basically comes from, it, it, its root is kind of favored, the favorite ones. Now I can tell you, um, that I hope this doesn't sound proudful, uh, prideful. God sent me to Tallahassee. Um, and again, <laughs> I almost don't want to say this, but by definition, you're, you're, bene- you're beneficiaries of God's election. <laughs> so, sorry, I mean, I, I don't mean this in a proud way. I just, it means that God will bring you his favor and his grace. He'll put certain people in your path to bring out the best in you. It's up to you to take advantage of that. To give you an example, I'm not, don't, don't hear me and think that I'm so special that God sent me to this church at this, like, let me use the prison as an example. In, in prison, I'm the only chaplain that is doing this School of Kingdom ministry. Um, and in fact, I'm endorsed uh, by a, a denomination called the Vineyard, and I was the first person to ever apply to the Bureau of Prisons in that denomination, and they didn't even know that they existed. So, meaning anybody else in that denomination can now apply to be a chaplain in prison. Um, Not only that, I've had the privilege of baptizing 125 inmates in the last year and a half. And I, thank you, I I don't attribute that to my own skills or my preaching abilities. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty decent, but I'm not, you know, I'm not the greatest Um, I prayed many years ago and told God honestly, I'm not the greatest evangelist, nor am I the greatest p- preacher. So God, if you're calling me to go fishing, let me go fishing in a stocked pond. <laughs> and I don't know, that may be a lazy prayer or that may be a, a prayer of faith. I just wanted to do things easier. I've always wanted to go to where people are hungry and thirsty for the Lord because you'll see so much. And so I I, I want to go where there's fertile soil. And that's been my prayer. God sent me to a stocked pond. And so here you go. Prison is it. (laughs) Now, you all are blessed and highly favored. I can tell you that with my heart, and if you follow the Lord, you will experience things that are so unique and special that it will provoke others to jealousy in a good way. Paul, Paul said that about himself. That was his motivation, and, and I hope in some sort of way my message stirs you and provokes you to follow the Lord in a deeper way. Then Paul, in this uh, last part of the chapter, he says this hymn And it's as straightforward as it sounds. Persecution always presents the believer with the same question. Would you deny Christ if it meant being set free from your suffering? Paul says if you deny him, he will deny you. Meaning, if you renounce, disown, or repudiate the Lord, he'll do the same to you. That is a... a, a, What he's getting at, this is the conscious decision to reject Jesus. Um, this that is entirely different than being faithless. Being faithless is faithlessness is wandering from him, being distracted, being caught up in your sin. This is, but yet he says he will still be faithful. So don't don't be confused about the two. Even if you're caught up in things that are distracting and, and detract you from your relationship with the Lord, the Lord's still faithful to you. If I ask you all, how many of y'all believe that the church in America is distracted? (laughs) Well, if you said amen, maybe you shouldn't answer so quickly because you're the church. (laughs) You're the church. Uh, And so, are you distracted? 
being, as I said, being distracted and focused on your sin is entirely different than rejecting Jesus. That's the doctrine of apostasy. I got saved in a Baptist church camp and attended a good Baptist col- uh, church in college, and I went to a Bible church after that, and, and they taught the word really well. Um, oh, my little son. So I went to these good churches that had really good sound doctrine, and a popular sentiment in those circles is how far can a person go in their sin before they're cut off, and if they are cut off, were they saved to begin with? Um, It's like they can't fathom what apostasy is. And I don't want to go down a rabbit trail because uh, there's no need, but this is a new idea, this is a novelty, a new idea in Christian theology um, that if you reject Christ, then you weren't saved to begin with. Um, the early church didn't believe that. And so I always wrestled with these questions in Scripture. They, you have these warning passages that are like, golly, that's dangerous. And I would be bewildered because I would go to a good church, a good Bible teaching church, and they would say one thing, but Scripture would kind of say something else. Long story short, In this chapter, Paul says in verse 5 that no one is crowned the winner unless they compete according to the rules. Likewise, in in, in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, Paul similarly writes that he disciplines his body and puts everything under his control so that he would not be disqualified. So over and over again, you are charged through Scripture to fight the good fight, to persevere, to endure, to share in suffering. Even if you're faithless, God is faithful, but if you deny him, he'll deny you. It's dangerous. But I believe better things for y'all. I know that you wouldn't be in church unless, uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be here unless you've done that. So he continues in chapter 2, verse 14, remind people of these things and solemnly charge them before the Lord not to wrangle over words. This is of no benefit. It just brings ruin on those who listen. Make every effort to present yourself before God as a proven worker who does not need to be ashamed, teaching the message of truth accurately. But avoid profane chatter because those occupied with it will stray further and further into ungodlessness. St. John Chrysostom said something else that was relevant to this message. He said, we must not mind insulting men if by respecting them we offend God. How much time and energy have been wasted by debating and arguing with people who have already believed and hold, hold their entire lives around false doctrines? I get the sentiment to try and win people over. Um, and, but Paul will soon say that there are certain people that have propagated such falsehoods that everything that they say is poison. In the early church, the main warning of the church was not to listen to false teachers. They had these, these Gnostics that came into the church that taught false doctrine, and in the Gospels, Jesus described them as wolves in sheep's clothing, Now, as a prison chaplain, I've had a unique experience of learning about all sorts of religions. Um, And every now and again, I run into those that are diehard believers of their religion, which I would have to say is false. Uh, Let me give you one example. Um, There's a religion called Rastafarianism. Um, It's actually a religion, it's not just uh, music. True Rastafarians believe that Jamaica is hell and Ethiopia is heaven. Why? Because the white man captured them as slaves, sold them into slavery, traded them throughout the Caribbean. And so true Rastafarians would say that the white man is the embodiment of the devil. And their savior, Messiah, is this emperor, Hali Selassie, who was crowned the son of David, the king of kings, the emperor of Ethiopia in the early 1900s, 1914, I believe. He claimed that he was the long, 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 long last grandchild of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. 
And so he took on this Messiah mantle, and this is what Rastafarians believe is their Messiah. So I can confidently say that's false. So Paul continues to not get involved in those things. Don't listen to their message. Uh, There's other crazy beliefs out there. Um, But Paul continues and says, "Their, their message will spread its infection like gangrene. Hymenaeus and Philetus are in this group. They have strayed from the truth by saying that the resurrection has already occurred, and they are undermining some people's faith. However, God's solid foundation remains standing, bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from evil. I may be the only one in the room that's seen gangrene. It's pretty gross. Uh, I was a hospital chaplain in Dallas, and one day I was called to pre-op to sign a living will uh, for an elderly gentleman before he went into surgery. He was in his 80s, he had gangrene in his foot. Gangrene is when a part of your body loses blood circulation and it dies, and it gets kind of greenish black. It's gross. And so the the only way to fix that problem is to cut it off. That's it. There's no saving it because there's no blood circulation. And so Paul is using this analogy to avoid these people, to cut them off because they will spread their infection to you. And these people, (laughs) they're like a a walking conspiracy theory. (laughs) They may have sincerely held beliefs, but they are sincerely wrong. And those who hold such beliefs are usually belligerent if they're challenged with sound logic or doctrine. And you can probably identify them uh, in your daily life, but the point that Paul says is don't entertain their ideas. Don't argue with them. It'll only produce more godlessness. They'll get so defensive about their beliefs because it's what they've been taught and held on to that they'll wrap you up into it and get offense will be created. And Paul continues, now in a wealthy home, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also ones made of wood and clay. And some are for honorable use, but others are for ignoble use. So if someone cleanses himself of such behavior, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart, useful for the master, prepared for every good work. But keep away from youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faithfulness, love, and peace in company with others who call on the Lord from a pure heart. But reject foolish and ignorant controversies because you know they breed infighting. And the Lord's slave must not engage in heated disputes, but be kind toward all, an apt teacher, patient, correcting opponents with gentleness. Perhaps God will grant them repentance and then knowledge of the truth. And they will come to their senses and escape the devil's trap where they've been held captive to do his will." Paul's language of saying that there are some vessels of honor and some vessels of dishonor in a house is is basically saying there's fine china that you eat off of, and then there's also some other bowls of ceramic that you sit on. Some are used for special occasions. Some are used every day for ignoble occasions. (laughs) And the Greek insinuates that Paul is referencing a bedpan of some sort, a toilet. I think everyone in here wants to be fine china. God wants you to be fine china. And if that's what you want, then the instructions are clear. Reject foolish and ignorant disputes. Flee from youthful passions. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. And follow the Lord with a pure heart. How many of y'all, if I don't raise your hands, have done things in your youth, youthful passions that you regret? (laughs) We've probably all been there. You get into a heated debate or argument, a fight. You get in uh, an impulsive relationship with somebody. That's what Paul is referencing. And again, Paul is saying these things because he is going to die. These are his final words to his true son in the faith, this young pastor in Ephesus, 
And he's basically telling Timothy in so many words, you do not have time to get distracted on frivolous regrets. You cannot afford to get caught up in the same things that the world gets caught up in. You must maintain your focus on the Lord and please him as this is your focus. And when you do that, don't be surprised that persecution will come, suffering will come. Don't shy away from it. These are his instructions to his, his son. So Paul is writing and, and telling us all to maintain a pure heart, to follow the Lord. Like, this is it. What else are you going to do? You're God's chosen people. You're his fine china. There is no backup plan. <laughs> and so I am encouraging you to follow him with singular purpose. Everything else cannot compare. It does not matter as much as what it means to follow Jesus. I don't know what it looks like specifically for you, but the call of God is the same for all of us, to take up your cross and to follow him. And when you do this, you'll be a light to the world. You'll be this lamp that dispels darkness. Amen? Amen. So let's close in prayer. Lord God, thank you for this day this word. Sometimes it's hard to hear, Lord, that we just, we got to give it all up. Um, but you're worth it. And I pray that for those that are hearing this message, that they would respond and say yes. Simply yes. Whatever you want, God, I'll do it. I'll follow you. Wherever you call me to go, I'll go. Whatever you call me to say, I'll say. If that means being a fool in the eyes of the world, so be it. I pray that this, these people, these, these, your sons and daughters, follow you with such a pure heart that they are prepared in season and out of season. That you can call on them any moment and call them to the plate and say, this is it, this is your moment. And let faith arise and let miracles happen and let your, your light shine. Bless them, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Um, if the prayer team, School of King Ministry, if you all want to come up and if you guys want to receive additional prayer, please come forward. I'm happy to share with you. God bless you as you go this week, um, or you could stay for prayer. Amen.